younger generation should know what what happened to us I think they should they should know my name is David Moskowick and I was born in Kronjus Slovakia And as a matter of fact, one day I worked in the Pope's residence and I asked him, why do they use a Jewish boy for many Catholic plumbers in town? He said, you are the best. I was born in Czechoslovakia in a little village named Konyush. It was in, a, in the mountains. It was a farmland, like most people, everybody was in, on the farm. We lived off the whatever was growing in the, on, on, on our land. There was about 250 families, and 10% of the families were Jewish, and they were all religious, kosher, everywhere was kosher. You couldn't, you couldn't live in the town if you, wouldn't, if you, wouldn't, you weren't kosher. I wore payas as a young man. I went to Cheder. And of course, we went to public schools. In the public schools, there was grade one to four. And then in the other room, there was two rooms, uh, from four to eight, and then you graduated. That, that's all the education you could get in our community. As poor as we were, we came on a Friday night. It was singing, and, and it was just beautiful, because you didn't know any better. There was, there was, there was life, you, you, you lived. And, uh, and as poor as we were, I never wore shoes. I was always barefooted. And my mom, of course, had to look after everything because my dad was a peddler. He was always away. Sometimes he came home with two horses, sometimes with one cow, or sometimes with 50 sheep. And, uh, and that's what he was doing for a living. But, uh, when, uh, in the war, when the war started, Hungary got that portion of Czechoslovakia, so I lived under the Hungarian rules, so I learned Hungarian too. And that's why I'm alive today, of course, because the Hungarians were better to the Jews than the Slovaks. The Slovaks murdered the Jews before they were asked to do it. You know, we didn't have a radio, we didn't have, we had no hydro, we had no water system. We, had, we were very primitive uh, really, uh, p people. We didn't know anything. My dad was the only one who read a paper. That was, that's in the later years after, uh, after the, the Hungarians took over. To be a Jewish kid, you know, you were always being harassed. Uh, you know, but I was a tough kid. I couldn't handle myself. I could take care of anybody who, who, who asked for it. When I used to beat up a kid and he got bloodied, I walked in the classroom. The teacher didn't ask him what happened. He looked at me, Dave, what happened? Because he knew I was the one who did it because you had to be tough. And that's why I survived, to, I survived because I was always a tough, tough kid. Now we went to school one morning and the, we saw a different flag on the, on the, on the school uh, pole. It was a Hungarian flag and, and Hungarians took over so that, you know, you had Hungarian teachers, so you, you went to Hader first and, and you, you came home and went back to the to public school and, and they teach you there 
Hungarian and Slovak. So you spoke at home Yiddish, you spoke Slovak on the street, and you spoke Hungarian in the class. After two or three years, and Hungarians took over, they started taking the men away, and, and, and they used them for, for in the front lines, and they used to dig uh, bunkers for the army. So, so of course, many of them were killed because they were in the front lines. So all the men, the younger men, sort of disappeared. Of course, we never saw them because we were taken to camp before they, got back. they never got back. We were like a big family. The whole community uh, did things we, 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 you know, very close to each other. So we noticed uh, then the la last a year before we, we were taken to camp, they would take away all the all the food from us, like the, the wheat and the corn, and the, you know, and they would they would we would have to go and 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 walk to a, to another town to get the bread because you couldn't make your own bread, but. Uh, if you had good neighbors, they would they would sort of help you out. I and mean, my dad was uh, sort of the, the most educated man in town because he came from the city. He married my mom. She was I don't think my mom could write. I'm not sure. I of course, never saw her writing. And my dad used to used to go to the city when he was with the with the lumber company. Uh, and he used to bring a paper home, and the people used to run over to us and he wanted to know what's happening, what's happening in the world. And then we saw things where people saw uh, bodies uh, wired up to get in bunches and they were thrown off the, into the rivers and you see them, you see bodies floating on, in the, on the waters. So we heard those stories, but we didn't take us, I was too young to, I was too young to even think about it. I didn't, I didn't, I was interested in my own, in my own, uh, life. One day, the town crier announced all the Jews by next day at 10 o'clock <coughs> should be take so many pounds of clothing or whatever and, and to be go in the front of the synagogue and then tell the why. why. So, so next next day, of course, we all get panicky, and I was still a young man. I was running. We didn't 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 know what's happening, and we lined up, and they put us in the wagons, and the the Hungarian police got us in into those wagons, and they took us into a a, a city, which is about 10, 12 miles. Uh, they call it Ungvar in Hungarian or Uzharod in, in, in Slovakian. And they took us to those brickyards and we, we stayed there for a few weeks and there was no roofs or nothing. You stayed between the bricks, whatever, and, and, and you know, my parents put sheets or whatever they had to have pri a little privacy. There's no beds. And we stayed there for I don't remember exactly, I must say, but two, three weeks. And then they load us up on those wagons and they would put us so many people, we couldn't, we had to stand up. There was no place to sit or, or lie down. And the man would, would rip the piece of floor up so they had to use it as a bathroom. So there was a system and there was lots of fighting going on. Who goes to the bathroom when? And of course, for the man, it was a lot easier for a woman to go to, to go to a, to, to a hole in the, in, in, in the ground on the train. Um, and then we were on the train for two, three days. We, we came, of course, we came to Birkenau, to Auschwitz. Uh, I remember getting out of the train and then we saw those piles of piles of shoes and things and then, then that big smokestack in front of me. I still remember today. So they line up the women, children on one side to the left, and the men and the men and boys to the right. And I followed my mom, and the German SS guy. He grabbed me by he had a he had a, a, a cane and grabbed by the neck and pushed me around around him to go to my dad. And I I, I ran around and circle and ran to my mom again. And he grabbed me again and pushed me. So my mom and the two 
younger sisters went straight, to, of course, to the gas chamber. And my dad and my older brother and myself went to the right. So did my sister, too. But she wasn't with us. The women were separated. And uh, we stayed there uh, for a couple of days, and then we got our number on tattoos on our hands. And after a couple of days, we marched to a camp named Buna, which is part of Auschwitz, but, but it was a, about, I think it's about a half an hour, two hour walk. It was different, but you still, I still had my father with me. I still was, had my protection. I didn't, you never imagined anything else happening. Just, you're gonna go, you, as long as I had one of my parents, uh, I felt sort of safe. And of course, we marched into Buna, and then we were divided. I was put into a camp of kids with all the youngsters, which Elie Wiesel was in the same bunk, which of course I didn't know who he was, but he was there. And my dad and my brother went to different barracks. And uh, of course, the first night for kids alone, sleeping on those, on those boards and on the bunk, and I remember many of the kids cried, mommy, mommy, those kids never survived. When they needed mommy's help, those kids were first ones to go. And uh, I was, we were there, we were there till, till, till January of 45. In Bunam, they, 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 they separated us to different jobs. I was chosen to be a bricklayer, so for a couple of weeks, we were, stayed in, we stayed in the camp on an open field and they had bricks and cement and they taught us how to put bricks, how to cement, how to build corners. It's very important that building is building the corner is the strength of the, of the, of the, of the building. And uh, after two, three weeks, we were, of course, started marching to work. And every morning we, we, we got up. One thing about the, the Germans, the, clean, the cleansing was important. We showered every morning and every night. And you were inspected if you, 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 were, you were clean. So I, I walked to, to, the, to the factories or wherever the work we were going, we marched. Of course, there was a band always playing the same, the same music, going in and going back. And, and I was a brick, worked with the bricklayers. I, they were building something, and I used to carry bricks and cement, and, and we were, all the time I was there, I was doing the same, same wall, because every time the wall went up one floor, they, the, the, they came and bombed it and knocked it down, and then we started cleaning out the bricks again and building that wall again. So all the months I was there, I was working on the same wall. But we worked with the civilians, with the Pol Polish uh, civilians, and they, of course, they stopped for lunch. I had lunch, and we, you know, we didn't get lunch. We had a bowl of soup. They call it buna soup, which was, I personally think, was just cut grass and, and boil it because, because there was something, find stones and a piece of wood in it. So there wasn't much of a soup, but there was, there was something you put in your, in your mouth, you sort of. And then, of course, you marched back. There was five, six kids came back, went together, stuck together, and we stayed alive together because alone you couldn't survive. You had to have protection. When I see a pack of wolves, sometimes I used to watch, when I came home to camp, I used to watch the, those, those things when I saw five, six little dogs would, would attack a big animal and take it down, and that's us. We looked after each other. We were together all the time and marched together, and, and one day my dad, I used to see my dad every, every night, and I, he tells me once the, this person took his bread away that morning, the piece of bread we got. I went up to him, I says, you give this bread back to my dad or the last time you ate bread. And I meant it too. And, and, and uh, I brought those kids over there and we looked at him. I said, do you understand what I'm saying to you? 
this bread goes back to my dad, or you, 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 won't, have, you won't never eat it again. The next day I went back, my dad says, yeah, he gave, he gave the piece of bread back. And I always knew how to look after myself. And because I, I walked barefoot all the time, so it was very fast. So I took, used to leave the wood shoes out, and I, when, when the Germans used to bring the bread in on a truck, and I used to see it coming. I used to start running, so by the time the truck came beside me, I was as fast as the truck, jumped up, and started throwing bread off, out the truck, and the Germans with a gun said, eh, she's, he's gonna shoot me. I didn't care. I, if somebody gave me a bread, I would let him shoot me, because you were so hungry. So of course, when you threw the bread down, your friends were chasing it, and they end up getting maybe one bread, because you, because everyone is running, chasing, so we always had that little extra. So I used to take my share of my piece of bread and get, took it to my dad, kept my dad alive. Because once they get too skinny, they would, the truck would drive by between the people and pick the person up and throw them, and you never saw the person again. They took them to, to, to Auschwitz. So I knew that. So I used to watch my dad because he was kind of skinnier. And I, and I tried to help as much. I needed myself. I, I was starving myself, but I still, because my, my father always favored my older sister, but she still lives today. She's 92 and she lives in Florida. He favored her. I wasn't her, I was my mom's favorite child because I was helping her on, on the farm. And uh, so I thought when I go back home, I'd be her favorite son. Unfortunately, it never happened. You didn't know when I saw that chimney, they did nothing to me. Uh, not, you know, I didn't know nothing. All the things I'm telling you now, I didn't know until I got home. And of course, of course in January, and we were in, in, in camp till January. In January, the 20th of January, 1945, the Russians were getting really close because you can hear the guns, the, the earth was shaking from, from all this blasting and everything. And so next day, they told us to line up and we st and I couldn't go with my dad. They, they keep, the, every barrack was separate. And we started marching. That was the dead march. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. That was the worst part of the whole, whole camp. And we marched for two, three days with no food, no nothing. And we ended up in a barn. We slept overnight there. And then they marched us into another empty camp who, who, who was emptied out, the people was or taken out. They stayed overnight there, then they gave us a piece of bread, and then they loaded up open trains. And I remember when they put me on top of the people, the train was so full, they put me, on, I was, because I was the, the young one, light one, they threw me on top of people's head, and there was no room for me to slide down to the, to the floor to, in, in the train, like till people choked and died and whatever happened there. Uh, it took a few hours before I slid down to the floor, and then we were, on that train uh, for three days, I think, three or four days. And no food, no nothing. They just came, stopped once in a while, threw all the dead bodies out, and uh, kept on going. And I remember on the end, there were so few bodies, uh, you know, so cold. So I slept, I, I took a dead body and, and pulled it on top of me to give me a little protection from the, from, from the snow. The, and I kept my, my mouth open so the snow would fall in, into my mouth and I got a little, little dampness on my lips because the lips were dried up. And you could hear gunshots all the time because as people tried to get out, I guess, out of, jump out of the train, they would shoot them. And then we arrived in Buchenwald. Buchenwald was worse than Auschwitz. Buchenwald was, they take you there to die. So we come to Buchenwald. I got, I got out of the train, I couldn't walk. I was just crawling on my knees because I was you know, not walking for a few days and, and, and not eating. So I, I rolled out of the train and I remember walking into the snow and we walked into Buchenwald. They left us there all day and all night outside. So people were dying, freezing, and I saw one uncle of mine rolling on the ground there. He was out of his mind, he didn't, he was, didn't make sense. But you don't care. I think if I would have seen my father, I don't think I would have cared, but that time, you were so desperate, 
you just want to live and you don't care for nothing. You're not a human being anymore. You, you become nothing. You, 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 you know, you're just like an animal. And then we end up in, after, after night and day in the outside and many, many people, that's why I lost all the villagers which I knew and traveled. And they, you know, they, that's, that's when my dad and my brother died someplace on, on, that, on, that, uh, on that, that march. And then they put us in a bunk, in a barrack. And they pushed us into a half of the barrack and they had soup there. And they gave a bowl of soup. I crawled under the, under the bunk, which was, I don't know, six inches maybe. I crawled under that bunk around, I don't know how I made it. If there would have been a nail sticking out, I'd be still there today. I would, but you take, you didn't care. I went around and I got three bowls of soup. I went three times around. I crawled under the bed, under the bunk, came back. And the third time the guy looked at me and I was sort of scared. I stopped going. And that's why I survived because I always, always did something. So there was, and, 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 and see, every morning you got up, they gave you a, it was like a penny, uh, something, a little hole in it. And that was your food, that, that was your thing for the food, bowl of soup a day. So I would keep it as long as I could till late the afternoon because you, uh, you knew you, there's a soup coming. And uh, we were there for, I guess we came in January till, of course, till, till April. And, and uh, we used to walk around all day, there was nothing to do, so I used to just walk around and, 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 and then you saw people who were sort of dying, the lying down or out of their heads, and I would grab their thing out of, uh, from them because they just died a few hours earlier, and I used to take two, three of those things a day, and I got two, three soups a day. And that's why, so, and then on the end there, the, they were trying to, to wipe out, kill everybody in, in, in the camps. So they used to come in every day. They had a quarter, whatever quarter it was, I don't know. And they used to take tons of people, line them up, take them out. I understand after they told us, they would dig a hole, the Germans would kill them, they bring the other group out, they would cover up, dig a hole, they'd be shot. They were doing this for days. And I used to hide and run away and I, I went up in the, between the rafters on, on the, you know, on ventilation. I used to sit in there when they came into the barrack. But then they got me the, the, one day. So I started marching and I knew if I go to the gate, I won't come back. I threw myself to the ground and people walked on top of me. And then also when they had a quota, a quota, I understand that 5,000 a day, after, I found out after the war. When they had their 5,000 people, they closed the gate. All the that people we were acting dead, we had to get up and run back to our bunk. bunk. And that's that, that and, and of course, of course, uh, then April 11th, the Americans arrived. We heard lots of noise outside because the plane was flying so low, you know, you feel they're going to hit the barracks. I, I saw this big white flag hang. I didn't know what white flag meant. So we ran outside, uh, run. I couldn't run, I could hardly walk, because I was on the end of my life, sort of. Another a few days, a few weeks, I would have been gone. I could, you know, it's cool. anyway. And the Americans were right there. They're all black. I never saw a black person in my life. They're chewing gum. They move their mouths. So I thought all the Americans are black and move their mouths. Because the very seldom you saw a white soldier, just the officers were white. But this, the whole army was black, you know. And uh, of course they came in and they didn't know what to do with us. They, 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 they kept throwing cans of food. We didn't know how to open the can. And, 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 and the food was so heavy, like, like in the Second World War, before you were born, the fatter it was, the better it was. That's the, was. That was a thing then. Today, we don't, of course, you know. So they used to give us this fatty foods, and many people died because their stomachs were all dried up, and, and so many people died. So send, but because we were close to Czechoslovakia, we were close to Buchenwald, wasn't that far away. The Czechs sent in their people. They lined up all the Czechs and Slovaks. They looked after us. We were better treated like the Hungarians 
didn't have that because the Hungarians lost the war. And, and uh, they put us into the barracks where the soldiers, where the soldiers, uh, the, the SS people lived. But still, for days, they were very disorganized, sort of, to, to look after us. But the Czechs uh, sort of gave us, we had a little better, better connection than the, some of the other, other uh, prisoners. After a while, then they, they give us a choice. You want to go to America to be adopted or go home? Like Wiesel, he chose to go to France. He became an educated person because they looked out. I chose to go back to my little village. And of course, going back to the village, you got on a train. The trains were so full of people, I always were on the top, on the roof of the train. The thing is, Europe, there's lots of tunnels. So you go on top of the and, 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 and you know, you, you choke, the smoke, the, the fumes are terrific. But I was always on top of the train, and many people fell off the train. The train would go, 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 stop, no bridge. Back up and go another, another route, because there was no bridges. The Germans blew up every bridge uh, there was. So, but when you came to the cities, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know nothing about anything. I was so naive. And, uh, Every city we came to stop, the Jewish organizations were there at the train stations and gave us food and whatever, you know. I remember we came to Budapest, so I spoke the language already, I was getting closer. Because when I was a youngster, Budapest to me was the end of the world. I didn't think that the world was further. I didn't think there was behind that anything. And um, it took us a few few days, few weeks, whatever, I got, I got uh, close to my village and the, the fellow, one of the fellows I was with the closest stayed in the same bunk, the same bed, and he went to one little village and I walked to my village. I remember it was a spring day, I was up on a cherry tree because you didn't go to a store to pick up cherries. You want to eat cherries, you went on a tree, sitting here on top of the cherry tree picking cherries, and a kid comes running. I had five, six kids sitting on the tree, my, my friends from school, and said, your sister is home. So I said, listen, if I get out of this tree and my sister's not there, I break your arms. So I go down there, there's my sister walking. She knew I'm home. When she came later, she saw every city, they had this big signs with all the names on it. And she looked up and she knew I, I, was, I was home. I, she, she knew I was alive. And so that's where I met my sister. And then, of course, we stayed in that little village for, for a few, few months. And um, there's nothing to do. There's no, only a few kids came back. There was about 10, 12 kids came back alive and the, no parents, no nothing. In 19, 1948, when Israel became Israel, the Czech Republic was very pro-Israel. They let all the Hungarian Jews who got away from Hungary came into Slovakia, to Czechoslovakia, were smuggled into Vienna to go to Israel. Many, by the thousands, came through, and I spoke Hungarian, of course, so the Jewish organization lined me up with a young lady we lived together for a few days just to get to know each other. And we went through as a married couple. They gave me a ring and went to, and went to Vienna to go to Israel. For, biggest problem was to get rid of that girl. She, she meant business. I wasn't interested in girls those days. And so then they smuggled me out of Vienna. To, I didn't go to, I didn't go to Israel. I wanted to go to the United States because I had my aunt there. And they smuggled me out to Salzburg. I lived outside Salzburg for two years there as a plumber. I worked for the Americans as a plumber and for two years. And of course, Canada didn't accept the Jews, so I waited for two years. I used to go for an interview every, every so often. Ten kids went, nine were accepted, and I was never accepted. I was healthy, I had a trade, but I wasn't good enough. 
And then a new, a new uh, ambassador or whatever it was came in and interviewed me and he accepted me and I came to Canada. 1950, I arrived in Ottawa. I still live in Ottawa. So today, I married a fine scene girl and I had a beautiful, I got married. I was married for 51 years. I have three children and eight grandchildren. And uh, I went in business here. I was very successful. I had a very successful business. And, to, and my wife died six years ago after 51 years of marriage. And I met Ruth Kalaf. She lost her husband about two months apart. We knew each other. And so I live with Ruth Kalaf, and I'm the happiest man in the world today. See, I was never like, I came home from camp and I just went to live my life, forget about camp. I never, for years, I never, never discussed it. As a matter of fact, the first time I went to light a candle, when the, the prime minister was there at the, at the parliament building, and, and, and the only reason I went there because I, I became a conservative. It's not a story. As you know, there was that one crazy man who, who did all these tr troubles. Today, you have many, many crazy people going on. So, so things actually didn't improve because just as many people today, different religions are being wiped out daily as we talk. It just is sad what's happening uh, in the world today. And I'm very fortunate to have that good life that I have in my age. I'll be, six, I'll be 87 next September. And I still walk my 12,000 steps daily. And I feel good about myself. And life is good.